All right, everyone, if you'll take your seats, we can finish up this tremendous day. So how has your day been? Pretty amazing. The morning was spectacular. I got a complaint coming up here. So I got an opportunity, I made an opportunity, I made it happen to try to get around to as many of the breakout sessions as I could. They were pretty engaging, yes? Excellent. And a special thank you to all of the presenters and the moderators, people who have given their time and then really did uh, get us engaged in, in excellent discussion and moving toward what we wanted, which is thinking about some solutions and what do we do and really delving into the difficult issues and difficult problems, recognizing that many things that we have, what's the word, chastised and um, ostracized along the way are precipitated, as Frank and others have told us this morning, by people's experiences and they react and respond naturally, right? And, and that we need to figure out some ways to help them um, perhaps make different choices, but that it's something we all need to be involved in. So before we conclude, I'll say it now, thank you all for being here and thank you all for um, really digging deep and thinking about all of these issues. We greatly appreciate it. So the charge now is, now we're, now we're informed, we're all on the same playing field and the work is just really beginning, right? We've gotta keep going. Um, and we'll talk about that. So I'm very happy that you all have returned, as I said, to, to know the science and know the predictions and predictability and epidemiologic studies, et cetera, is only to know half the story. But if you don't know about resilience and healing and recovery, we really are not seeing the full picture. And as we, as the interested crew, um, as providers and educators and uh, people in law enforcement, et cetera, really need to understand the full picture. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. What's, what's on this other end and how do we balance? So this last topic for the day is introducing and building self-healing communities, understanding resilience and recovery. And we have two tremendous speakers here. I have worked with them both, um, both, both highly trained and highly skilled. Connie Knoll is a uh, nurse PhD nurse, and um, many of you have heard her speak at some of our prior community health conversations um, in the past, and she's really an expert on this issue, these issues of recovery and resilience. So she's here again to talk about this. She's a psychiatric nurse practitioner and recovery counselor, and she practices up at the University of Maryland, Upper Chesapeake Health in Hartford County. She was down here at the medical center, and that's where I met her many years ago, and one of the very first time, I'll tell you the kind of heart Connie has, the very first time I met her, she was talking about having volunteered following Katrina and what that experience was like working with the Red Cross. So that's Connie Knoll. And I gave a shout out earlier this morning, right at the tip of the morning, to Ruby Parker as a member of the family tree. There she is, as a member of the family tree. And she's the manager of public engagement and training there. Um, and she leads the effort to educate policy make makers, professionals, and parents about the impact of ACEs. So we've had experts all day. These are our last two speakers of the day, and I ask them to come forward. Thank you, Donna. Is this, can everybody hear me? First of all, I'd like to say how excited and privileged I feel to stand up here in front of all of you and talk about something that's really dear to my heart and that I love to talk about. Um, one thing I don't like to say, but I'll say it, is that I've been a psychiatric nurse for over 45 years. And I've been a Red Cross uh, disaster mental health volunteer for over 25 years. So. Um, and I have a lot of passion about uh, helping people, and I became really interested in recovery, actually, as an offshoot of the disaster work that I did uh, starting in the mid-90s. So I want to start off with the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Administration um, definition of recovery. And 
Before I start, I want to pick up on what I heard from the previous speaker, and I just want to tell you a little story because recovery-oriented work is very story-based. And I think you will all remember the um, occurrence a few years back when uh, C Captain uh, Sully landed the plane in the Hudson. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, I had the privilege of hearing his co-pilot speak once. And he was talking about what happened to the people on the plane after they were rescued. And what happened was, believe it or not, about 25 to 30 percent of the people on the plane took a cab to an airport and got on another plane to go where they were going. <laughs> Some people never got on a plane again. Some people took years before they got on a plane again. And one person, a young man, decided to become a pilot because he was so inspired by the captain. So what I want to start off and just pick up, although I haven't been with you all day, one of the things I really want to say is that it's not necessarily what you get exposed to, although some things are absolutely horrific, horrifying things. It is actually what comes after that and what you do with it. And many children normalize terrible occurrences and they do fine for a while, like Vicki Beck was just talking about. And then what happens, they're used to seeing mom get beat up by dad. And they think that it's OK to hit somebody that you love. And then they, 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 can, they excel, some of them excel in school and they do well. They get into a relationship or they have their own children. And then they're stuck in some communication patterns that they can't get rid of. So there's so many different levels of function that can happen after the exposure of trauma that I don't want you to think that one size fits all or everyone is an individual. So I wanted to make that point before I started. So there's lots of different components of recovery. And this is the SAMHSA Wheel of Recovery. I'm sure, have, how many people have seen this? Oh, a good amount. But this goes into all the aspects whoa, uh, that are considered in terms of thinking about how a person recovers. And I'm going to go over some of them in detail. Then I'm going to talk about wellness and what goes into a sort of a wellness toolkit and what you can use every day. So <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about is hope because hope is the real underpinning of recovery. Hope is the anti-stigma antidote. So I heard someone say the other day that the most powerful thing that you can say to someone who has an invisible illness to give them hope is, I believe in you. And so, the components of this recovery and this model don't necessarily, it's not like a cookbook where you do A and B and C. It's more like this is the kind of approach that helps people the most. And one of the things that happens, and we heard in the very first community conversation, um, that a lot of people who are in recovery and are successful do not tell people that they're, they're in treatment and they're doing well and they might be taking medications and they're doing functional, you know, professionals, uh, productive members of society. And the people don't know it because they don't, nobody likes to say, well, I have bipolar or I have uh, a depression or I've recovered from substances. That's not uh, something that is encouraged even. So one of the first things to talk about in terms of recovery is saying that recovery is real and it's achievable and it's possible and that people who have had symptoms and suffered with circumstances are able to define themselves and to start on a journey and lead productive lives. So I always 
encourage staff that I work with to talk about the fact that people can have a meaningful life, people can reach goals. So I think one of the things that's important when you, when you do this is you have to think about, are, do you have any kind of internal uh, stigma yourself? And I remember um, many years ago, when I was first exposed to the idea of recovery and peers and working in a different way with individuals who come to us for help, was that I realized that I might have more hope for someone who had a new diagnosis of a brain tumor or a cancer rather than someone who had a first psychotic break. And so I had to get in touch with my own bias and my own stigmatizing. Uh, I'll, th it just, I'll give you an example. How many people have seen that commercial on TV for cancer where it talks about this is a hard diagnosis to hear and then they say, this, <coughs> our doctors are the best, you've come to the right place. How many times in the mental health world do you get that as a greeting message? Okay, so why don't we start doing that? You know, why not take that I one idea and go take that one? So anyway, everything begins with hope and understanding that it's possible. Uh, recovery also has to be culturally competent and culturally sensitive. And lots of these slides that I have, you could spend an hour on each one. But what I wanna say about this is that it's important to know that some of the things that are published and are given as examples of different cultural beliefs, you have to be careful about stereotyping because people are different and people are individual. And just because someone has a certain kind of background or a certain aspect of one of these things doesn't mean that everybody who has that is the same. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind and to understand that individual in a more uh, definitive kind of way. Recovery is person driven. And so a lot of times, especially in healthcare and on the inpatient hospital side, you hear about person centered care. And what that really means is that the person who's coming to us for services or the person who's obtaining services needs to feel like they're the most important person in the treatment plan. One of the things I like to say to patients that I see, and I fall back to saying patient because I work on inpatient a lot, is that you're the most important person, you're the center of the treatment plan. And one of the reasons why this is so important is because what we wanna do, and I'll talk about this more in a second, is empower individuals so that they can learn to control their own lives and their own symptoms. Um, choice leads to empowerment, and it makes the person feel more autonomous. Our goal should be that the patient or the person coming to us for services learns how to manage their own lives. And to do that, they have to learn how to trust their own judgments. Recovery is holistic. So on this slide, you see a list of things that uh, are all aspects of living. The things that have the little stars are the things that typically get emphasized when someone's in clinical treatment. But there is a movement in many places, and University of Maryland downtown uh, outpatient services is a recovery-based um, type of treatment center. So you're gonna look at self-care practices, you're gonna look at things about employment, creativity, is a person employed, um, and complementary and alternative services. I would just add a caveat here. Uh, in practice, I get an awful lot of people who wanna, who wanna use cannabinoids, who wanna use THC and things like that. And all I can tell you is that from a professional standpoint, um, there's a lot, a lot of evidence, and that's even what the national organization says. There's not evidence that this 
helps everything, and it does get marketed as a panacea. So I just wanted to mention that. Recovery also includes relationships and relationship issues. And one of the things that I think I learned uh, from disaster mental health work was that the feeling of being connected to another human being is very healing. So that after those kinds of major events, one of the tasks of helping people through is getting them to shore up or create connections with others. As a person who's been a nurse and done a lot of care, I do believe that the empathy and um, trust and relationship between two people is really the foundation for healing. Excuse me. So one of the things that happens to me is my mouth gets dry. <clears throat> now you've spent an entire day talking about trauma. And I won't go into this slide because I think you've heard a lot about this all day. Um, the sort of the foundational pillars of trauma-informed care have to do with safety, connections, as I just mentioned, and managing emotions. And for some people, particularly children and adolescents, it's identifying emotions and then managing them. Because if you think about some exposure to trauma occurs before a person even has verbal abilities. They may not even have words to describe how they feel. And so that leads to an adult who has no idea how they got triggered because they didn't even have a word to use when they first got traumatized. So identifying and managing feelings is key. So, so those are the, the things about the wheel that I wanted to emphasize for this group today. Another thing I wanted to talk about is how many dimensions there are. So there's the health dimension. There's the sort of like the biological, healthy, living sort of um, aspects. There's having a safe and stable home. That's probably a key for many, many people who are affected with some kind of symptoms. And that's why you see recovery-based treatment looking at housing, looking at employment, looking at employment gets to that sense of purpose. So it's not just a question of taking your medications and keeping your appointments and doing what the people in the residential house say. It's about the person understanding that all these things and feeling healthy about all these things is what leads to them being able to have a meaningful life. Uh, there's an interesting uh, experiment, I believe it's in California, where the first treatment for suicidal homeless, uh, ho homeless veterans is to have these small houses and create a safe, stable place to live. No questions asked, that's the first step, because with that, then someone can build on the rest of the skills they need to develop in order to feel like a productive member of society and to have that kind of meaning. So getting back to that plane ride and the people who had different functionality, one of the things that is really important to talk about is that there really is no yardstick of what is normal. It is what is normal for that person. Now, there are some things that automatically go outside. If you break laws, if you do things that are not socially acceptable, if you, you know, uh, go to church in a bikini, or you, you know, do things that are outlandish, um, that's not going to be looked at as within a realm of normal. But one of the things that's hard on a day like this is if you're not used to hearing about a lot of symptoms or a lot of pathology, 
we, we know what happens. We, you start thinking, well, I think I have that, or I remember, I know that my Uncle Joe has this, or I, maybe my daughter is affected like this. And that happens, we know, because all nursing students and all medical students, as they go through the chapters and they go through their systems and they learn about disease and illness, lots of people start thinking that's what they have. So one of the things that is important is to talk about function and normality because there isn't this yardstick of this is what's normal and this is what you get measured against. It's what your baseline is. So what goes into all of that function? And this is a cute little thing because lots of people with mental health issues think that they're the only ones and they're not the only ones. What they don't know is everybody else is thinking the same thing. Everybody thinks of this at least one time in their life. So what are the things that go into function, that go into thinking about wellness tools for each individual to achieve this normal life? Well, I start off with what I call the basics, which is sleep, nourishment, and what you eat, and exercise. And I think it's a fairly comfortable clinically based thing to say that if you make major healthy changes in these three areas, this is equivalent, if you have a mild depression, this is equivalent to medicine. So making sure, if you know you need at least eight hours of sleep, then you need to schedule yourself and do sleep hygiene so that you get eight hours of sleep. And that single thing is going to improve someone's mood probably more than a lot of things. Um, being careful about what you put in your body in terms of nourishment. Uh, if you eat, you know, I heard once that if you have black coffee and a donut in the morning, it is the worst breakfast possible because it just spikes up your blood sugar and it puts you on a fluctuation all day. So you may have to learn how to, and I'm, I'm needing to do this myself, as you can see. You have to think about what are the best choices for you and what makes you the best person you can be every day. So the second level is relationships. Personal relationships, loving relationships, where you get support, family, community, church, uh, social groups, where do you get support? And then productivity, work relationships, school relationships. All these things go into how well you get along with others probably has a lot to do with how good you feel at the end of the day. So for a lot of folks, working on these issues and creating optimum situations is a pivotal part of feeling good about yourself and being your best person every day. So diversion, enjoyment, fun, I just love this little picture. Uh, double your pleasure. Anyway, um, this area actually requires a lot of work for some people because some people do really bad things to enjoy themselves. And, I, and, and this is like, you know, drinking six beers after work. You know, how many times do you hear, oh, you've had a bad day, go have a glass of wine tonight, have a glass of wine tonight. Well, that's fine, except sometimes that glass of wine turns into a half a bottle, and then it turns into a whole bottle. And then before you know it, you're, you're in a category you don't want to be in, and you're, you're creating problems. You're not solving them, and you're not coping with them in the right way. And that could be with marijuana, it could be with cocaine, it could be with um, other kinds of self-destructive behaviors. So people who have symptoms that need to be managed often have to play uh, a lot of attention to this. And I think that it's something that most clinicians and a lot of people aren't schooled in and don't get a lot of information about how do you help somebody with this aspect, other than say, don't do that and don't do that. But what should they do? How do we use people's strengths? How do we use people's interests? How do we uh, talk about their creativity and what they want to do? 
So then there's, there's sort of like the big picture. The sort of why am I here, what am I doing? Um, what is the world about? How am I contributing? What is, what is the meaning of life? And if you can't see what it says inside the tree, it says the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose in life is to give it away. And that's from Pablo Picasso. So I just, I just love that. Um, some people can go through their life and they're not really paying much attention to this. But a lot of people are, and some people do. And so this is an important area to groom and to be aware of if you're on the helping side of, um, help, of uh, treatment. And with that, I'd like to introduce, as you've heard, or you're coming back up, or yeah, okay. This is Ruby. Hi, can everyone hear me? I have switching mics here, so I wanna make sure. Can you guys all hear me in the back? Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of bring it home for you guys. So you've had a lot of information that's been shared with you all day long. Um, you've heard about what are ACEs, how they impact the brain. You've talked about how that might impact the different communities you work with or in the different fields you work in. Um, and then Connie just talked about how that, what we can do to build recovery amongst individuals. And so I'm going to talk about how to, what does it look like to build communities that are self-healing? What does it look like to build a community um, that maybe doesn't experience as many ACEs as the communities that we're living in now? Um, and so that's what I'm going to bring it back to. Um, and so really what I realized is I, I prepared my presentation and I, I came here today and I listened to what everyone said and I thought, gosh, everyone just stole my whole presentation. I, I'm pretty sure that everything I'm going to say is really a, um, a reiteration of what you've probably heard today. And, but I think that that's really the beautiful time of right now is, is to remind you what you've heard today. I think oftentimes we go to things and we wonder, we leave and we go, well, what do I do with this now? And, and what I want you to all know is you already have the tools in your pocket. You already have the tools. You've heard them today. I know that many of you are probably inspired. And so what I hope that this is, is a reminder of how those different tools are going to become useful to you as you leave today and you go back to your job tomorrow, as you go back to your neighborhood, as you go back to your family, wherever that is, to share this information with other people. Um, and so really, it's important for us to understand that ACEs um, are really important things for us to know exist. And some people go, I, I already knew this information. I'd heard this before. Um, and now what we're doing is we're building a common language for all of us to talk about. Um, what it doesn't do is it doesn't give us a step-by-step -step guide. What do you do with this information? It doesn't give us a roadmap. And that's because we have to develop that. We have to decide what works best in our community, what works best in our family, what's going to work best with the people we work with. Um, and so this is our opportunity to take this information and figure out how that works with what we do. Um, and so what the things that we know have worked well for people who have resilience, people who have built um, resilience in their families and in their communities are three different factors. And you've heard them all before. So I'm just, again, I'm telling you what you've already heard today in different spaces. So the first one is, is capabilities. Do people believe that they have the capability of doing something? The second one is attachment and belonging. And the third one is culture and community and spirituality. So I'm going to go into each one of those. But the individual capabilities, when we saw this morning when Kay and Frank talked about what are ACEs, and we watched that video, the little sketch video of adult capabilities and how important it was for individuals to believe that they can do something, that's here is thinking about the fact that we have to believe that we have the opportunity to make change and that we have to believe that we have possibilities in our lives. And same thing for children. We need to make sure that children grow up with two different things. They need to grow up with self-regulation, so their ability to regulate their emotions, which as Frank talked about, can be very challenging when they've experienced some of this trauma. And they have to believe in self-efficacy. They have to believe that they have the capability uh, and they have to believe that there's possibilities. 
And so sometimes what we see when we talk about ACEs is people say, well, I'm an adult and I have an ACE score of whatever that ACE score is. How, how do I, how did I get here, A? Or B, how do I change the course of the rest of my life now that I know this information? So some of it's about what can we do for children, but a lot of what's conversations happen around, well, what about an adult who's already had these situations happen to them? And I think if we look at um, Tonier, who is here this morning, when we think about what Connie just talked about with individual's recovery plan, we can think a lot about how important it was for them to believe to have a possibility of a course path for them to move forward and to understand that there was a possibility for them to do something. And there's a lot of different people and things that help them move that way, but those are two factors that are gonna help individuals um, build capabilities and build skills to move forward. So the second piece here is attachment. When we had that panel up front earlier this morning, how many of those young folks talked about a relationship or a person who helped them? All of them, all of them, every single one of them. Tonier talked about a program, but really probably the people within that program who gave her those opportunities to change the course of her life. You know, so those things were huge, relationships, what we know about ACEs and resilience is that children who have at least one supportive adult are the folks who are going to grow on and not have those ACE scores topple on top of them. They are going to grow and have possibilities because they have support. They have someone who tells them that they can move forward. The other thing to think about is that those relationships, if they don't happen when children are young, um, they can happen later in life. It's much harder. When we think way back to those first slides that we saw Frank showing us, and you saw what those branches, the synaptic density, all those parts in our brain, that communication that's happening. What we know is that our brains decide what's most important. And so if our experiences have been negative, our brain's going to continue to go down a path of survival. But we, what we know is that you can build relationships and you can build new connections inside your brain later in life. It's just a lot harder. But we can do it, which means that when we work with adult populations, we have the potential to build resilience in those adults, and we have the potential to change communities. It's just going to be a little bit harder than if we do that work when they're children. Has anyone tried to learn a new language as an adult? Not going so well. It's not working out. So that's the thing, is that these things can change. We can add them back in. It's just harder. It's going to take a little bit longer for us to do them. Um, and so what we know about relationships is it's really important that we have caring and competent relationships. So competent relationships are going to be relationships that help us build new skills and new knowledge. And so they're not just someone who has compassion one time and, and tells you that they're there to support you, but people who show up time and time again and, and show up even when that can be tough. Sometimes people who have experienced severe trauma are going to be people who might not be someone who you want to show up for time and again. They're going to be testing you. I would imagine if Tonia were still here, she would tell us that she might have been a tough person to get along with when she came out on the other end of that. But someone stood there and said, we're going to keep on coming. We're going to keep on showing up. We're going to keep on supporting you, even if you test us. So thinking about the people who we interact with who test us might be those very people who have had a lot of trauma. And it may not be that they're purposely trying to test us. It may be that their brains only know one way to communicate. That's all that they know. And so it's a biological response, not a personal response. So the last area that we know that really builds resilience and people who and communities who have resilient is people who have a sense of community. So they have their individual capabilities, they have a sense of belonging with other individuals, and then lastly, they have a community that supports that. And so I think when I was on one of the breakout sessions, I heard someone say that they, they believe that they live in, a, they are from Baltimore, and that Baltimore is a traumatized community. And so what does it mean when we live in communities that we might consider to be broken or to be traumatized. 
You know, what does it mean to live in a community that is building resilience amongst all of its members? And how do we do that? How do we build communities that are going to have support and to have resources and skill building for all its members, for everyone that's part of that community? It's going to take a lot of work. I mean, I think the one thing that I always think about, we can't wait for policies and for structural change, we have to be the people who start to make that shift. Because it's going to start at that individual level and the relationship level, and then we can move into that community level. So what we know from communities who've been successful in this is that they follow us, they have all different methods of how they've been successful, but they follow a similar path here. Um, and so what they're gonna do is they're gonna follow these, these ideas of um, expanding leadership, they're going to be people who are coming together, they're sharing ideas, and then they're making decisions based off that new knowledge. And so that re repetition is something that helps build resilient communities and helps build self-healing communities. Um, and so leadership expansion isn't just about um, putting someone at the top in charge of everyone else. Leadership expansion is about bringing people to the table. It's about getting people at the table who haven't been at the table before and letting them share their voice. So it doesn't make a difference. It's not about having um, someone in charge who has that, but really bringing lots and lots of different voices to the table so that they can be leaders of their own kind. <laughs> um, and then lastly, and then secondly, it's about coming together. So now that we've brought more people, now we need to come together like we're doing here in this room um, and we're going to share our ideas. We're going to share our learned experiences. We're going to share what kinds of things were successful for us. We're going to talk about what might work in our community. We're going to talk about things that we've done that didn't work well and what, why was it that it didn't work well. Um, and by bringing all of that information together, we have the opportunity to make changes and make decisions that make sense for moving forward. So if we make the same decisions that we've done in the past that didn't work, we're not going to see a lot of growth, we're not going to see a lot of change. But if we make decisions that are with new voices that have shared their learned experiences, um, and then we start to, to learn that, like we are doing in this room today, we've shared a lot of different voices, we've shared a lot of different experiences, and now we can start to say, well, this is an opportunity for us to move forward. You know, we heard today voices of people who have, have suffered severe trauma, and they shared what worked well for them and what didn't work well. And so that's our opportunity if we were people who, if we're people who haven't experienced that same trauma, to listen and say, well, that didn't work well, that wasn't working, but these different strategies are working. And so what are some new strategies that we can bring back that might work well in order to build a new space that doesn't re-traumatize people? What does it mean to have a law enforcement that doesn't push people against a space and re-break a nose? You know, what does that mean and how do we do something all while creating a safety net for everyone who's there? And so really we have to think about that we all together have a much more powerful stance than what we have as individuals. Um, and so one of the things that we think about when we talk about ACEs is how it's impacting all different fields of work. It's impacting people who work in education. It's impacting people who work in law enforcement. It's impacting people who work directly with families and in, in a hospital setting, um, in a caregiving provided community. All different areas, but if we all together work to reduce ACEs, then we have the opportunity to reduce all those social problems and health problems all at the same time. So we can continue to work on our own and make some difference, some impacts on our own. But unless we start to make a change at a larger level and we start to share our ideas at a larger level, we won't see that large impact happen at once. And so we have the opportunity to all together work together to lift everyone up in all aspects of our community. And so really, I always like to say, I've heard it say a couple times say talking about hope, and that this is our opportunity. Hope is there. We have the opportunity to make changes, and we have the opportunity to go back today and to tell someone about something that we've learned. We have the opportunity 
to go back to our workplace tomorrow or to our neighborhood or to our church um, or wherever it is that we go every morning. And we have the opportunity to, to make a change. Um, but really, we cannot wait for that change to happen elsewhere. We have to start making those changes here with everybody. Um, and so I, um, I want you guys to each turn to your neighbor. And I want you guys to take two minutes and tell your neighbor what is one thing that you think you could do differently based off the knowledge you learned today, either in your personal life in your neighborhood or with your friends, family, anything like that, or in your larger community, whether that's your workplace or your, um, your church community, whatever it is. So turn to your neighbor, reintroduce yourself if you don't know them. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. If you can hear me, clap three times. All right. I used to be a camp instructor. That's what we did at camp to get everyone's attention. I wasn't quite sure. I didn't have a tool like Frank had to bring everyone back in. I was a little nervous there. So did everyone get a chance to share an idea that they had? Does everyone feel like they had at least one thing that they knew they could do after today? Yes. Good, good. I hope that was a resounding yes. <laughs> I know I have a lot of things I want to go back and work on. So I think every time we have these conversations, it reminds us of things that we could be doing. And it may be things we were doing at one point and we kind of lost track of them. We lost track of the importance of them. Um, and this reminds us of how important it is to do something. This reminds us of, of why we do the work that we do is when we hear about the impact that it has on people's lives and the impact it has on communities. Um, and so in order to make sure everyone gets out of here on time, we're going to do some questions. So we have um, a microphone on the side here. Kim's got it. Um, and so if anyone has questions about um, resilience and recovery and what that might look like, now's your opportunity. You, did you say yes? No? No questions? Nobody has any questions? Just inspiration? Everyone's just excited to move? How about some, is, does anyone want to share what they thought they might do? Their plan? Their one thing? Yeah, up front here. That'd be great. I honestly was thinking that, um, from listening to um, Tonya this today and just thinking of my own childhood experiences and knowing about the reality of um, generational abuse that goes on and on. Um, and then we talk about, well, what can we do? How can we make a difference? How can we stop it? And I'm thinking, how? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you really take a child out of that? I mean, you can help in whatever way you try, but they go back into that home. Mm -hmm. Or like Tanya said, um, the, one of the worst experiences she had, although she was living in a horrible situation, was being taken out and removed from her loved siblings. Mm -hmm. So I was saying this to my two partners on either side. And then I said, well, the one thing I'll take is I'll say when I'm with people, tell me about what happened. Yeah. So I'm going to take that back. That's a great one. So she said to that shift between what's wrong with people to what happened. What happened to them? Anyone else feel brave enough to share what they think they might take from New York? Yeah, we've got another one over here. I just want to say thank you um, to everyone, all the presenters, um, even the, and I, it's not a congregation, but it's a community of people. Um, I've seen different reactions. I've seen, um, you know, just so much um, today that I'm really full from all the information. And 
for me personally, it's listening. Because listening will give you a different ear of empathy. And empathy is not pity, it's just understanding. And I think that yeah. each and every one of us, um, with the resources that we've received, we're smarter today. And we're wiser in, in the decisions that we're going to make when we're dealing with our communities, our families, our coworkers, um, because it's, it's everywhere. You know, yeah. and we've got to really listen to people and really have an empathy ear now and not a preconceived notion because that brings forth that judgment. And so I just want to say thank you because I'm really just, I'm elated from all of the information. And I've, I've really wanted trauma-informed care for so long because this is what we need. You got to get to the root cause of why people do what they do. And then you have to address those generational things and then deal with it accordingly and not the way we think it should be dealt with. So yeah. thank you. Yes, absolutely. We've got another one right up. Thank you, because I was thinking on the same level as you. But you know, a lot of times, well, no. I have a granddaughter, one of many, who uh, used to say, I can't hear you, when you were telling her something that she did not <laughs> want to hear. <laughs> Figure that out. And um, to that end, we have to hear what people are saying. Yep. We have to be in the state of, I can hear you even though I'm hearing different words, it's the meaning that's coming from what you're saying that I hear. I hear you hurt. I hear it. I feel it. And in my world, let's pray and ask God what to do because I'm not that smart. <laughs> okay? So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We got some people way in the back. Yeah. I'm really touched by your comments. Hello, everybody. Hello. We all had such a wonderful time here. I'm just still overwhelmed with all this food. <laughs> and I thank you, Jesus, for the food and your people. But anyway, um, my thing is, um, as a missionary and, and as a former teacher, is to tell everyone you matter. Everyone matters, and you matter, I matter, everyone in here matters, and we ought to treat each other like that. And the young people in that generation, they ought to stop justifying their wrong behavior. And we have to teach them all over again that it's not gonna happen, and it's not, it may happen the way you want, but it's not in God's will. And you need to straighten up, man up, woman up, and be who you are called to be in Jesus. Amen? Bye. <laughs> so I, I just like to close with a couple of comments. I really liked some of the, a lot of the stuff that you said, um, Ruby. But I think that one of the things, you know, I was talking about all that functionality. And no matter where you are and what you're doing, and whether this is personal or professional or something that's work-related, it's really important that you be mindful of all those things about you. And the reason for that is because that's what gives you the energy and good heart to do the best you can every day with challenging situations. So Margaret Mead said that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful people can change the world because it's the only thing that has. Ruby and Connie, thank you ever so much for that presentation while Kim pushes me out of the way. Um, before I forget this, and I would never want to forget this, there are people who have run around all day in red shirts. So the University of Maryland medical system folks are in red shirts. That's my team. They've worked very hard to put this together, and in particular, Kim Davidson. 
And just once again, a really big thank you to all of today's speakers. I think each and every one has been tremendous, and we are grateful. I got a few things to finish up here. So we gave you the website earlier if you wanted to follow along. This is just a listing of the events that we have done heretofore. We really thought two years ago, right, Connie, that we were going to do one day about mental health, and that would be it. And people said, what? Where's the rest? What's next? What did we miss? So we've been doing these every six months and intend to continue. So we have a date already for November 2019, and it's November 13th. I asked earlier, please do your blue evaluations. They will help me legitimize and keep, go keep going with these so that I can show someone, um, show someone's that they are working and that people are interested. Um, and we also want to meet your needs. We have, last year we decided to do two on depression and anxiety. And this year we decided to make it about children. So we thought that in November coming we would do something completely different. But what we've decided is there's so much depth and there's more to do vis-a-vis -vis ACEs. And you've heard several references today that these 10 ACEs are part of the story, that there's death of a parent, that there are other things that are not articulated within those 10 ACEs but are clearly part of the stress and trauma that children experience. So we believe, this team believes, and many of our um, great friends who work with us on this, that there's more to do here. So in asking about those evaluations, I said, please don't miss that question at the end which says, what do you want to hear? Some of the things we've thought about are bullying, the LGBT community and some of what they deal with, homelessness with children, suicidality, et cetera. But I, at this moment, we're thinking that we'll go to ACEs Plus. So a little bit of the recap vis-a-vis -vis ACEs, what else is out there related there to that's causing some of the um, negative results that we may see people experience, both in somatic and in behavioral health. Um, so we'd, we'd like your thoughts on that. And as well, we've, we've started the discussion. This, is a, this was an energized group today. I said it when you came in, and I meant it. It was a different kind of energy here in this room. And I'd hate to see us lose it. So we've had those cohorts break out and just begun to skim the surface. And with Ruby's question, what are you going to do? You know, uh, sometimes I can be really bold and say, what are we going to do? Is one of my questions. What are we going to do as a community? Part of what we might decide to do in November is get back together as this group. And there were plenty of people that didn't get to be in this room. But what is it that we're going to do? And begin to think of some solution sets. So I throw that out to you. Please answer that question. We'll continue working. But we would love your feedback because we certainly want to meet what you want to hear about as we move forward in this work. So I had to say all that. Um, evaluations, evaluations. Did I mention evaluations? Yeah. <laughs> All right, and now we're going to raffle off. Find those raffle tickets that you probably, if you're like me, you threw it in the bottom of your bag somewhere, you can't find it. But we're going to raffle off six books. Six books from Tanir Kane. And I'm going to find somebody up front to pull. Got my glasses on. Got to be here to win. <laughs> I guess they all start with five, four, seven, one. Last digits, two, eight, eight. All right. She's checking, she's checking. Okay. He's picking them all. All right, last four digits. Four, seven, six. Four, seven, six. Ah, all right. This book really is very good. It's compelling, as she was today. Maybe somebody else can give out the books. Ha! Last four digits. Somebody who came in near her probably. Four, seven, one. <laughs> the best uh... You know, this is pretty good when I start knowing the names of a lot of people in the room. This is great. Last four digits. Three, zero, five. 
305. Oh, I'm going back to the well. They went home. They went home. Four zero nine. Gotta be here to win. Okay, no four zero nine. Going once, twice, three times. This is fun. <laughs> three nine nine. Oh. Ooh, that's a lucky row over there. I'm, t I'm telling you, if, if you don't win today, you may want to go on Amazon and order one of these books. I kept this in my office, and Kim kept saying, can I have the book back? I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, Kim. I'm almost done. 269. Oh. Getting closer? All right, let's, let's see what we can do here. One eight eight. Yes. <laughs> it's this one is called Healing Neen. These are signed, and she wrote this one in 2014. That's what I thought. All right, and the last one, drum roll, please. Uh, Three, seven, four. No? One more? Okay. Three, six, four. There we go. All right. All right. Thank you all for coming today. I hope that you are taking home many gems. We appreciate you being here. Thank you all very, very much. You can drop your um, blue sheets out front.